Good afternoon. At least it's good afternoon here where I live in central Alberta. It's good to be here with you. Thank you again for the inviting me into your places and spaces. And uh, just so grateful to be here with you and pray God will bless you, not only through the reading of his word, but the teaching of his word as well. Uh, English-born Canadian evangelical theologian, pastor, and writer J.R. Packer was best known for his best-selling book, Knowing God. I hope you have one in your, uh, your um, shelves. It's a really good book. Read it. Anyways, in chapter 1, Packer highlights that a believer possessing a love for truth would be right in desiring to pursue and seek more knowledge of God. And then Packer asks a number of questions around that statement. How is a believer's desire for the truth and knowledge of God to be applied? Is it for a greater understanding of truth? A greater understanding of God? What about knowing God himself? Is the believer's goal to know the doctrines of God's attributes, for example, or to know the living God whose attributes they are? Good questions. Packer's thesis for his book is best represented with the questions that he asks. One, what were we made for? Answer, to know God. Two, what aim should we set ourselves in life? Answer, to know God. Three, what is the eternal life? Answer, to know God. Or as John put it in the 17th chapter, verse 3, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ. Four, what is the best thing in life? In other words, what thing brings the most joy, the most delight and contentment than anything else in life? Answer, to know God. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, the Lord speaking here said, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Packer then moves on and he asks, what are the evidences of knowing God? This is not a knowing about God necessarily, but knowing God in such a way that when the believer is faced with what Packer calls the losses or the crosses to bear, these things cease to matter. For what the believer has gained in knowing God, Packer would say, simply banishes these things from their minds. I probably repeated myself there. Packer then points to what he calls, quote, the clearest and striking, end quote, evidences of knowing God. And he turns to the book of Daniel. And on that note, on that cue, let's turn to Daniel chapter 6. And we'll read the whole chapter together. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give an account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished distinguished above all the other officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the perfects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O God, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Verse 10. 
When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and a plea before his God. Then they came near and said to their king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance, um, ordinance that the king established can be changed. Actually, no, is what they said. No, O king. Pardon me. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of, of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and slept fled from him. Verse 19. Then, then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And he came near to the den where Daniel was. He cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the, king, the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces. Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples and nations that dwell on the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you that you have gathered us together in this way. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us now by your spirit to understand Daniel 6 and its implications for us today. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your word is with us and it is eternal. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, for the work of the cross, the broken body, the shed blood. And we, we turn to that now, and we ask, O oh Lord God, that if there's any sin in our lives, that you would ask us, you would forgive us and make us clean as snow. I pray for my friends as we consider these things, that whatever's going on in their life, that they would know God. They would know you, truly know you. If that means coming to faith in Christ, may it be so. If that means renewing their promise to you, may it be so. May that be growing and maturing, may that be so. In whatever way, O Holy Spirit, that you lead us, we pray this for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we will be done our brief series in the book of Daniel. This is the last uh, message in Daniel. And we move into next week uh, with another series prior to Advent preparation, which we will begin here at this church, at our church here on November 27th. You know, as I think about what we've gone through, as uh, short as it may have been, but it was so rich, 
I hope we have learned some things about God. I hope we come to know God better. I hope we learn some of these things about God and his character through the lives of these Babylonian kings and Daniel and his three friends. Matter of, matter of fact, as it is said in the army, we have some lessons learned that we want to bring with us into today's story. We recapped those last week, so let's go over those quickly. One, God is sovereign. Two, one day God will judge the living and the dead. Three, God is merciful. Four, God will humble the proud. Now we skipped over some, uh, we skipped over one chapter, chapter five. We're not going to go past chapter six. Considering chapter five, uh, God didn't skip over King Belshazzar and his idolatry and disrespect and dishonoring of the one and true God. For the king had done evil in the eyes of God. And on the very eve of destruction of the Babylonian Empire, as the Medes and Persians were coming and surrounding the city of Babylon, and that very eve of that, as the text tells us, God wrote on the wall of the king's palace four words. Four words of God's judgment on King Belshazzar and his kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, Daniel 5.30. And today we pick up our story from that very night when Darius the Mede, it tells us in verse 31 of chapter 5, received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And that's the first character we're going to look at here. Darius the Mede is our first character in this story in Daniel 6. Now, if you remember the image that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about in the first chapter, the Medes and the Persians empire would be the chest and arms of silver. That other kingdom that Daniel says and describes to King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. In this story, we find that Darius favored Daniel. He favored Daniel. He made Daniel, as it tells us in verse 2, one of the three high officials over the kingdom. And when faced with the fact that Daniel would be thrown into the lion's, uh, lion's den, Daniel was much distressed, it tells us in verse 14. And Darius tried with everything in his power to what? Rescue him, verse 14. Indeed, Darius favored Daniel. We are introduced to Daniel in verse 2. One of the three high officials over all the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. All the other officials in the kingdom would report to these three high officials. And these three were, were tasked with the responsibility to ensure the king suffered no loss. We see all this in verse 2. Moving on to verse 3, we see there, uh, we learn plenty about Daniel in really the least of words. Let's read that together. Verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished among all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. One commentator described Daniel as one who possessed integrity, and I would agree with that commentator. Integrity in his service to the king and integrity in his worship and faithfulness to the one true God. Another commentator highlights that Daniel, quote, enjoyed God's blessings throughout his life, and I, I would agree with that. Because by the time we meet Daniel here in chapter 6, Daniel would have been in, in his 80s. And he would have been in captivity over 60 years. And Daniel the prophet was a man of integrity in all his service to successive kings and his worship and faithfulness to God. Next we are introduced to some other characters. You see the king had planned to set Daniel over the whole kingdom. We see that in verse 3. But the remaining two officials and the 120 satraps, according to verse 4, sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. You see, they wanted to get him fired, so they were trying to dig up some dirt and bring it to the king. But dig as hard as they could, they came up empty-handed. For the text tells us they could find no ground for complaint. They couldn't find any fault with Daniel. They couldn't find any error with Daniel. Why? Because he was faithful. Verse 4. And this brings up a contrast. A contrast between Daniel and these officials that we find here in verse 4 to 14 that should be obvious to us as we read through it. First we have Daniel the prophet, a man of integrity and faithfulness and dedication, in contrast to these government officials, government officials willing to conspire together and discredit Daniel. We have a godly man living most of his life in captivity. 
In contrast with an ungodly character, uh, ungodly culture, pardon me, and a malicious and malicious scheming men collaborating to get Daniel killed in connection with the law of God, verse 5. But why don't we just slow down here and take a look at Daniel a little more? Here was Daniel. He was faithful. He was certainly experienced in leadership. He was wise. He had a good reputation. reputation. He was a man of integrity. He was tested over 60 years and found without fault or error. Not unlike Job or Joseph in Egypt. And of course Darius would be wise to consider Daniel as over the whole kingdom. But the question is, where will the ground for complaint be found against Daniel? Well, it would be found in Daniel's worship of the one true God. It was Daniel's consistent, consistent faithfulness and trust in God that placed a target on him. Not his loyalty to the king, certainly not his ability and, and his leadership. God had brought Daniel into captivity for a time such as that, and Daniel in his faithful worship of God would certainly have encouraged and help prepare the way for the Jews to return home. Because what we have here, folks, in reality, is the story of the continuing saga of what God had commanded when Adam and Eve, through their disobedience, sinned against the commands of God. We find this in Genesis 3.15. The Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. We fast forward from Genesis 3 to, to Acts chapter 13, and there we find Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. They had traveled throughout the island of Cyprus, proclaiming the gospel, and they came upon what they called a magician in that text. And they described this magician as a Jewish false prophet. We also see in that text that the governor of Cyprus had summoned these missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, as the text tells us there in that chapter, to hear the word of God. But this magician, this Jewish uh, false prophet, opposed Paul and Barnabas and tried to turn the governor against them and away from the truth of the gospel. And it's pretty interesting how the Bible describes the events as a, really as a spiritual showdown. It was high noon, folks, in the dusty streets of spiritual warfare. We have God, the Holy Spirit, and the devil in active opposition. Listen to the way Luke describes this in Acts chapter 13, verse 9 to 11. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, that is that Jewish false prophet, and said to him, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him. In other words, immediately when Paul said this, he went blind. We think about our Lord and Savior Jesus when he was faced with those who were secretly planning to kill him behind the scenes. And while we were doing all this plotting to kill Jesus, they would show up in the courts of the temple and they would appeal to Abraham as their father. And Jesus saw through all this self-deception, through all this deception. And he said to them, you are doing the works of your father. We find this story in John chapter 8. And they replied to Jesus, we have one father, even God. And Jesus said back to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. Why do you not do what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. He went on to say, if I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Whoever is of God hears the word, words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. John chapter 8, verse 39 to 47. Friends, the king's officials could not find any evidence against Daniel. And I wonder if this reminds you of anyone else. We already mentioned one, Job, 
who God said of him, none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Job 1.18. We return to our Lord who was brought before Pilate and falsely accused by the Pharisees. Pilate found no fault in Jesus yet because the Pharisees applied, appealed, pardon me, to, to Pilate, to Caesar. Pilate handed Jesus over to be, to be crucified. Here's the point, folks. The Bible is amazing. It deals with real people in real places faced with certain real realities. To be double on that. Daniel was facing the reality of a den of hungry lions. What could he do? What would you do if you were there? He could stand on his record and hope for the best outcome. He had a great record. He could obey the unalterable edict of the king of Medes and Persians and only pray to the king or simply just stop praying for 30 days and let it go by. What did Daniel know at that time that we can so easily forget ourselves today? Simply, Daniel knew God. Sure, he had knowledge of God, and that's a good thing to have knowledge of God and to learn more and more about God. But Daniel knew God intimately, and it tells us in verse 10 that he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. He did not stop worshiping God, even though it might cost him his life. You see, brothers and sisters, Behind every accusation against Daniel, against Job, against Jesus, was the father of lies, Satan. Daniel knew Darius wasn't his enemy, nor the officials. Friends, if you choose to stand up and confess your allegiance to Jesus Christ in our culture today, be prepared to have accusations come your way. Be prepared to be persecuted in some way or form, either individually or corporately or both. And anyone else teaches you anything differently, they are liars. For Jesus said, if the word, world hates you, you know, know that it hated me before it hated you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they all will also persecute you. John 15, 18 to 27. Another time Jesus said to those desiring to follow him, count the cost. Luke 14, 28. Count the cost, Jesus said. Count the cost before you fall on you because it will cost you everything, even your life. Well, Daniel counted the cost. He prayed to God and he was tossed into the den of hungry lions. As we move now into the last verses, 19 to 28. It was the break of day and the king, after a sleepless night, rushed to the den of lions. That's verse 19. And Darius in Darius, anguish called out to Daniel, and he said, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Have you ever wondered what Daniel did all night long sitting among the lions? How about Jonah and the belly of the fish as he traveled to a distant shore? Daniel responded to Darius and said that God's angel has shut the mouths of the lions. That must have took about a tenth of a second. Here's the point why I'm saying this. We shouldn't ponder and speculate all sorts of crazy things. Too many times we focus on the trees and miss the forest. So often we miss the nugget of biblical truth by messing around in the bushes looking for some secret meaning or special or new revelation. You know, the things like the four steps to a successful prayer life or the three ways to increase your influence or to read yourself into this story and make it all about I don't know, a better life now or something like that. Packer has challenged us from the start. This text challenges us, more importantly, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Do we know God? Really know God? If Packer was right that we were made to know God, do you know God? Really know God? Of course the Bible commands us to grow in grace and knowledge of God, and we will if we follow him. But surely, my friends, this goes deeper than memorizing the Westminster Confession or the Apostles' Creed, which are good to memorize. It surely goes deeper than attending church once a week and serving occasionally in ministry or whatever you do for God. Friends, Daniel truly knew his God. He said in verse 22, My God, my God, the one I know and who knows me, that God sent one of his angels and shut the lion's mouth and we had a good night's sleep. 
I read that into it. Don't take that part. Just read, read the Bible part. My God, the one I know who knows me has found me, what did he say, blameless before me, before him. God counted him as righteousness because of his faith in him, just as Abraham and all the saints before us. And then, my dear king, I have done no harm to you or anybody else. So here in this story of Daniel and his three friends in, 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 the, in the book of Daniel, Packer finds the evidences of those who know God. And let me share four, four, of, four of his, and I'll work around them a little bit. One, those who know God have a great energy for God. That is, when God is dishonored, disregarded, or defied, or defiled, those who truly know God, Packer would say, stand firm and take action. Take action in the public square and in the private places. I'm not talking about riots here. When Daniel defied Darius to his peril, he was driven to prayer. My friends, where there's little prayer, there's little knowing of God. Two, those who know God have great thoughts of God. May it be true, I pray, that our short time here in the book of Daniel has opened our eyes to the amazing wisdom, truth, and might of our sovereign God. That it has opened our eyes to see the justice and mercy of our God. The glory of our God. If we've missed these, most certainly we have missed out in knowing our God. Friends, the overarching truth that Daniel and his friends modeled in their lives was that God is sovereign over all things, over history and over our lives. Nothing, not one thing that we encounter in our lives comes to us until it goes through the sovereignty of God. Three, those who know God show great boldness for God. Packer writes, quote, Daniel and his friends were men who stuck out their necks. Friends, this wasn't a recklessness in the, on their part. This wasn't foolhardy on their part. Read Daniel. They knew what they were facing. They had counted the cost and committed themselves to their God. Their decision was without a doubt, as they made it, an agonizing one. It couldn't have been easy. But when they decided it was right to move, they moved. It tells us here in the text, in great boldness for God. The Apostle Paul said, the Apostles said, to those trying to shut them down from preaching the gospel. In Acts 5.29, they said, we must obey God rather than men. Four, those who know God have great contentment in God. Can I ask you, are you at peace today? See, Daniel knew God and God knew Daniel, which brought great contentment and peace in his life when he was facing the trials that we read here in Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to say to King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves in this matter, O oh great king. Die or live, we will not serve your gods. Friends, those who truly know God are at peace with God. And nothing will be able to separate them from, as Paul put it in Romans chapter 5, 38 to 39, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Do you know God? Really know God? Father, I thank you. I thank you for Daniel, the book of Daniel, what a treasure it's been, even though it's been brief. We see the glory of God here. We see the sovereignty of God. We see Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego trusting you, Lord, in their trials, in their lives. Trusting you and knowing you and getting to know you. May we be like that, Lord, in our day. And I pray for those who are do not know you, Lord, have not crossed over, in a sense, from wickedness to righteousness. Lord, I pray for them that they would take that step, that you would grant them repentance, that they would turn toward you and acknowledge you. Father, I pray for that, whoever's hearing this. May you be glorified in all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Shalom.